Welcome to Apologia and another edition of Ham and Egg News, where we react to Ken Ham reacting to things. We have a little bit of a different um, format today for those of you that normally join us. Uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jenison, who is a geneticist um, here at Answers in Genesis, he is going to be talking about a debate that he did um, just recently um, online. Oh, hey, I watched that debate and I was on the after show and even got to ask Nathaniel questions. So I guess I'm wondering what you're thinking in terms of the debate, in terms of why set up with, with 20 minutes of history first. Good question. Well, I'm obviously the most perfect person to talk about this. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Jenison is going to um, talk to us a little bit about a debate that he did with Dr. Herman Mays. Did somebody say my name? Oh, hey, it's Dr. Mays, everyone. The person who debated Nathaniel. Well, I guess you could add some insights, too. You okay sticking around to see what Dr. Jenison has to say? Sure. And so this is a, just kind of a screenshot of a debate they did on non sequitur. Somebody said non sequitur. Oh, hey. It's Steve and Kyle from the non sequitur show. The hosts of the debate. We've arrived. Paul, you talk about actual science on this channel. There's no need for me. I don't know what the hell I'm doing here either. Don't ask me. Everyone just shows up. But Dr. Mays is here with me. So I think we got this covered. <sighs> I told you, Steve. But since when do I listen to you, Kyle? Henry Morris, Dwayne Gish, if you know these names, you know they did uh, hundreds of debates back in the day. And over time, their evolutionary opponents eventually said, you know, we're not going to do it anymore. This is not worthwhile. The reason that professional scientists don't tend to debate creationists anymore is because there actually is no debate about evolution in general or common ancestry. And there hasn't been for over a century. Any sort of thing that can be construed as a debate is really a discussion to show the fallacies in creationist arguments. So there is really nothing to gain for it in terms of science. The only reason we can do it is to make people aware that the arguments that creationists are making are not in line with the science at all. And then the other issue is it takes time and scientists are actually doing science. So a lot of scientists aren't any more interested in debating creationism than they are debating a flat earth. The, the non secular show is no friend of young earth creation. Uh, no. So it's a <laughs> when he says we're not friends of young earth creationists, that's not entirely accurate because we've had several young earth creationists on the show. It would be better to say that we don't agree, but we still allow them to come onto our platform and debate their ideas. There's a fundamental difference between not being friends with young earth creationism and not being friends with young earth creationists. We have many friends that are young earth creationists. We don't agree with their position. So we're not friendly toward that philosophical or theological mindset. Absolutely. So this book just came out last fall, Replacing Darwin, The New Origin of Species. And I wrote it really for an audience that, doesn't, that does not agree with me. I have to say, I think what's going on here with Nathaniel's book is that it is sort of for an audience that doesn't necessarily agree with him, but his goal is not like my goals as a scientist to end up at a better understanding of nature, but his goal is to introduce people to the science in a way that leads them to his particular views and his particular religious ideology. It's geared towards people who are sort of leaning towards a young earth creationist view already. So I think it's a little disingenuous to say it's written for just some fair-minded audience as any other popular science book would be. So I was quite happy to have an opportunity to speak to folks on a show that explicitly rejects young earth creation. That is accurate. We do reject young earth creationism. We disagree with young earth creationism as much as we do things like flat earth. However, we feel that if they want to come on and present their positions and have them challenged by other people, that's something that people will listen to and then decide for themselves which of the people talking about these topics have a better argument. So we were equally as thrilled to have Dr. Jensen on the show. And it came about, they contacted us saying, would you be willing to debate this topic? I said, sure. I specifically asked for Dr. Mays. He'd done previous de debates. Uh, I thought he handled himself very kindly. He was willing to do it. He's an expert in this. I respect his work. I've got one of the papers he published looking at the DNA sequence of the Sumatran rhinoceros. So it's a little misleading to say that he specifically asked for Dr. Mays. We were told to put together a list of potential debaters. We did that. Dr. Mays was on the list and selected from that list. And I said yes, but I didn't know if he'd read my papers or not, but you know, I mean, anybody could. And my goal in all this is to make the science as accurate as possible. So I regularly solicit 
people to, to give me critical feedback. He often says that he is interested in critical feedback from actual professional scientists in this realm, but I don't see any evidence at all that he subjected either his papers on the Answers in Genesis website or his content of his book, which is actually mostly borrowed from the articles he writes on that website. I don't see any evidence he submitted those to anyone with expertise in the areas that he's trying to talk about, because the methods and the approaches and some of the facts that he tries to do anyone with knowledge of biogeography or population genetics or systematics or molecular evolution would catch upon these things immediately. So I don't see any evidence that he submitted any of it to anybody that knows anything about the topics that he's talking about. Now, I've seen him in other talks before where he said he submits to other creationists, and he mentioned in passing that he submitted to one friend of his who's a theistic evolutionist. So I think that's about as far afield as he goes in soliciting for external review. Uh, we, we set a date for September 5, so just over a week ago, and explicitly made the focus we even put in the contract saying, it's not going to be your typical debate. It's going to be a review of this book. I had never signed a contract, so I have no idea what he means by a contract. The answer to Genesis actually sent us what they call a contract of things that we have to abide by, terms and conditions, as far as what we can and cannot discuss on this particular episode. And that's fine. Many large organizations do that when you have a very notable guest on. But this particular episode was directed specifically to address the book itself and not anything tangential to it, which I think Dr. Mays explicitly did. And the rest of the contract consisted of things like the discussion was to remain serious in nature. It couldn't go off the rails in terms of other parts of the Young Earth Creation model and that they got access to rights to the video. So as soon as the video was up, they could then take the video and use it for whatever purposes that they deem necessary. We found nothing that they asked was unreasonable. Correct. Unexpectedly, but I think in the end really helped, the non-sequitur show had, the, the night before, sort of introduction to this topic. So it was the two hosts, again, neither are uh, creationists. Well, I got to tell you, that's probably one of the most accurate rays I've ever been described since I've been on YouTube. Very well phrased. And I think we all know how obsessed Steve is with label accuracy. Plus an atheist and then another critic of Answers in Genesis. Shannon, uh, which one do you think you are? Are you the atheist or are you the critic of Answers in Genesis? Well, I don't know which one of us was blocked by Ken Ham, John. <laughs> <laughs> Would he block an atheist or would he block a critic of his work? Well, I feel like that's, a, that's an indicator that I'm at least more critical. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I deserve it. Yeah. But I think it was you, yeah. <laughs> to be fair. John Perry and Shannon Q, the guests on the debate pre-show. Of course you're here. <laughs> to review the science of it. How did that pre-show debate come to be? For me, I just got an email from Shannon asking. So I don't know what the plan was before that. Kyle knew that I had read the book. And he also knew that John had read the book. Kyle and I had had conversations about how I felt the book was being perceived by people who were already entrenched in that belief system. We thought it would be a good idea to sort of get everybody listening on a level playing field. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how the debate should operate in order for what the book says and doesn't say to be communicated accurately so that people could get a general idea or a better idea of what it actually says. Because there are a lot of heavy issues in this book, a lot of terminology. But I don't have a strong background in the science. And having someone that is very successful in taking hard concepts and making them understandable to everyone, which is John Perry from Stated Clearly, to go through some of these things. I was really excited to do it because Nathaniel and I had actually spoken with each other about possibly doing a debate, him and I, but Answers in Genesis wouldn't let him debate me, probably because I'm not a PhD biologist. Their whole point of using him is to try and get everything he does to make it look like he's a, you know, a legitimate scientist. We had actually talked about kind of tag team teaching the basics of the science because a lot of his arguments have to do with genetics. So we needed to teach people some genetics first. So he and I had talked about that and I was already thinking about how I would go about doing that. And so I pretty much had just in my head an outline of what I would do in that situation. So when Shannon got a hold of me, I'm like, oh, oh I already kind of know what I would say. So I was able to throw it together pretty quick. And it actually turned out very fairly. They said, we're not here to criticize it. That's the debate is tomorrow night. We just want people to follow the science. Uh, so I, I thank people for that publicly. And he did. John Perry bent over backwards to try to make it fair. He obviously doesn't agree with me, but uh, the fact that I think he got flack from 
those who would be his allies shows just how much he tried to be fair. And and, and I really appreciate that. Well, I'm, I'm glad he appreciated it. I don't I don't remember getting any flack from anybody, but uh, I was really just talking about how genetics works. I suppose I wasn't even really talking much about his book. I was just getting people ready for the type of information they would have to have to get into this debate. My hope was that then they could just start and really dig into the actual meat and potatoes of their disagreements. And Shannon also asked that we'd, we'd focus on the arguments, not, a, not on straw men, and recommend people engage the work. Yes. Yes, I did. There's a very specific reason for that. The book itself is heavily technical, and on a surface level reading, it has the, I don't want to say artifice, but it has the strong look of scientific accuracy. And without understanding what the book's actually communicating, you would just simply feel as though your position was reinforced based on his authority and the fact that the book looks very, very technical because you may not be able to understand it. So what I was trying to articulate was that I very much wanted Nathaniel and Dr. Mays to very clearly present what the ideas were in the book and what the issues were with those ideas in an accurate fashion so that it didn't allow them to obfuscate. However, Nathaniel, in the debate, on numerous occasions, instead of presenting his position, chastised Dr. Mays for not having the book memorized page for page. He used that tactic to put him on the defensive rather than presenting the position itself. So that's what I meant when I said I didn't want a straw man to be built. I wanted the actual position. He didn't really present his position, which is what I was afraid of, which is why I articulated that going in. Uh, it turned out very differently. And, I, and my first clue that this turned out very differently was a couple hours before we were set to go. So it was an 8 p.m. debate. About 5 o'clock, they send me the slides. By 7 o'clock, I'm able to review them, the slides of my opponent, Dr. Mays. I was only asked to send him the slides the day of, maybe even as late as that afternoon. In most cases, you don't get the other participants' slides or angle before a debate. That's usually something that you only hear when the debate starts. That's the whole point of it. Dr. Mays made this concession because Dr. Jensen requested that it be narrowed into a particular focus so as not to lose the audience. And he did this following the John Perry lecture and realizing that maybe there's too many moving parts in this book to get into one full debate. The book itself has about 10 chapters, and the last part of the book is basically many pages dealing with endnotes. The first three chapters are not that controversial. Matter of fact, they're basic biology. So him skipping a lot of that kind of stuff was definitely making sense. The heart of the book goes to really phylogenetics and things dealing with coalescent theory that Dr. Mays wanted to get into. So when he said if he wanted to narrow it down to very specific things, talking about mitochondria DNA and molecular clocks, that would probably wouldn't have been fine with Dr. Mays. However, he didn't even get into that part of the scope of his book. So this was done as a gesture and a courtesy on his part. And I had no idea that <laughs> I was going to have to send him the slides at all or why. I don't think that was necessary. It doesn't matter if it was an hour or, you know, days beforehand. Dr. Mays did not have to concede to let Dr. Jensen see his slides and know where he was going. And I never asked for his slides. I didn't want to see his slides. And the first tip off was they were very similar to the slides he gave in January of that year. So this is before he was ever contacted about reviewing the book. That was a debate with Charles Jackson. Wait, you debated Charles Jackson, the Jeff Goldblum wannabe school teacher guy from Genesis Paradise Lost. It went about as you expected it to go, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to see that. So the topic was basically the same. The evidence is basically the same. So I borrowed slides from that because I was talking about exactly the same topic. I had watched his previous debates, and so I knew what was in the slides, I knew the references, I knew what they said, I knew whether or not they related to my book, and I knew that they did not address the arguments in my book. I thought, "Uh uh-oh. David Baum, him and his students have done some really excellent work in the past few years where they have attempted to quantify the argument for common ancestry using very rigorous statistical tests across lots of different lines of evidence. I use those papers because they're excellent. If you're talking about a solid statistical quantitative argument for common ancestry, they're really the best that there are. So that's, I borrow from those. Now, Nathaniel during the debate had to ask questions about those graphs. So either he was asking rhetorical questions. There's an axis that measures a variation in a categorical variable, and it's an entropy measure is what they call it. And he had to ask me what that axis means. So if he read the papers, I think he should have been familiar with it. So apparently he was asking me a rhetorical question in that case. 
was rather flabbergasted and talking about seven o'clock, an hour before we go live, saying, the guy hasn't addressed anything in the book. What are we going to do? My entire argument with the book was that there are errors in it. Daniel says things, little things, like there are river otters native to Hawaii. There aren't. I specifically cited the mutation rate that he uses in his papers and in the book, and I explained why that's wrong. I explained why it's too high and tried to explain the difference between a de novo mutation rate and a substitution. That mutation rate is in the book, and that is in the slides. A lot of the problem with the book is he leaves out facts when they're inconvenient for his agenda. And so part of a critique of any work is not just what's in that work, but what it leaves out. And the work that he leaves out is stunning <laughs> as far as a blatant omission. For instance, in the debate, too, I ask him about coalescent theory. And he cites in his book, this is in his original paper that he cites from the book, about using a very straightforward algebraic relationship between the mutation rate and time. And he refers to that as the standard coalescent equation. Now, he cites an undergraduate textbook for that. And then his only argument for that is he, he's using the standard approach to the coalescent that evolutionists use. I do work in this field. I read hundreds of papers in this field. I have never seen anyone cite that equation from an undergraduate textbook and characterize it that way. That was in the book. So when he says, I'm not talking about the book, that's simply not true. I'm talking about errors in the book, and I'm talking about omissions in the book. We're there to talk about the topic that the book covers. And if there's some important facts that he conveniently leaves out of the book, that's talking about the topic of the book. And the main demand they've made, in, in essence, is it's not enough to criticize evolution. They are well aware that we've lobbed all sorts of criticism of evolution, saying it doesn't work, it doesn't fit the evidence, all these sorts of things over the years. And so they've said that their primary argument against creation has been, that's not enough. If you want a place at the scientific table, you have to give us an idea that we can go out and test in the lab. You can't just say God did it. Give us something we can go in the laboratory, in the field, and we can, we can do an experiment to see if it's true or false. He says this over and over again as if the onus is on everyone else to test his hypothesis. If he really has a hypothesis that makes clear, testable predictions, then he needs to be the one to go out and test them. If he goes out and tests those predictions and finds that the data match the predictions of his model, then he has a publishable research article out of that. And he publishes it, and if people find it convincing, it gets citations, and it spreads, and it affects the field. He can't just say, well, I'm making predictions, and I'm going to leave it on everyone else to go test. I went through that history and laid out what, what makes this book unique is it has these testable predictions. I'm saying this is going to happen. We don't know yet. It actually does not have testable predictions because most of the things that Nathaniel calls predictions are things that are first and foremost predicated on beliefs that are derived from his biblical interpretation. So, for instance, he's merely saying, making claims that variation inside of created kind would be neutral and genetic variation across the kinds should not be. <laughs> well, that's a pretty vague prediction, especially since he has no way of defining what these kinds are. He says, well, there are taxonomic families, but taxonomic families are just a kind of arbitrary distinction. Or some families have thousands of species. Some families might have one or two. So that's not really an adequate way. I mean, all the things that he claims are predictions in his book have either been completely debunked or they're so vague that you couldn't test them in the first place. Was there anything in the book that you felt was a legitimate, unique prediction of the creation model? No. I mean, none of it. He likes to present this book as some novel new creationism. And he sort of sets up this thing, well, what scientists are really critiquing is this old version of creationism. And now we have my new sort of sophisticated version that incorporates all this genetics. But really, at its heart, it's the same arguments that creationists have been making for a century. It's that there are these created kinds, and they can't define what they are. And Nathaniel is just doing a lot of hand-waving to make it seem like he has some predictions that you can really test about it, but there's not. So one of the challenges, if you watch the debate, is there was an audio delay. We knew this going in. I didn't realize how much it impacted the debate until watching it a second time. And so I remember during the debate thinking I was making a point and thought he ignored it and didn't respond. And well, he didn't hear it. So he, he couldn't. Yeah. And you could see the same thing the other way. I had no problem on my end with any lag. I mean, might, there might have been a little lag, but 
I didn't notice anything that would have prevented me from engaging in some back and forth dialogue with him. There was an audio lag, and there are several reasons why that lag exists. We use a particular software called vMix, and if some of the parties involved don't have either headphones or they use devices with a noise gate, that can cause a little bit of a lag. The interesting thing about this debate was that Dr. Jensen was using a Mac as his video and the screen that he was looking at. He also wanted to have a Windows laptop inside the call so that he could at any point pull up references to articles, give us the link, and we would be able to post them on the vMix software. The fact that he had two connections side by side where he was at in his location, both picking up audio, fed into that delay, but that was a particular benefit that he asked for that we provided. Yes, there was an audio lag, but there wasn't anything we could do to remedy that. And I should add that it was a pretty insignificant delay. Dr. Mays did hear his questions. He answered his questions. He addressed his questions. He asked questions that I know Dr. Jensen heard, but his response was still the same thing, that you didn't read the book when Dr. Mays actually had read the book twice. So I don't think blaming it on any kind of technical difficulties uh, seems to help Dr. Jensen's case at all here because it was a very nominal lag, to say the least. And what it was, as Kyle pointed out, mostly on his end more than anything else. I didn't feel like there were any technical issues at all that would have prevented him from either hearing what I was saying or responding to what I was saying. It certainly didn't affect me responding or hearing what he was saying. I was just like, oh, this is so frustrating, like for the technology to kind of get in the way of them being able to have this discussion was, was frustrating. The technology did not get in the way. The lack of response to the hard questions Dr. Mays was posing got in the way. The quickness to accuse the other party of not reading your book when he read it twice got in the way. The lack of answers presented to questions that are very much related to the topic at hand got in the way. The technology and the lag, yes, there was a lag, but that comes way down on the list of things that got in the way in terms of this debate. What mostly got in the way, I think, was the fact that there are two primary things that were supposed to come out of this debate. One, Dr. Jensen was actually going to give actual argumentation for his position that his book is supposedly giving, and then also give predictive modeling that we could use to determine whether his hypotheses and what he put in his book is actually the case. I felt he did neither. That's what got in the way. It's on a technical subject. You have this audio delay. It's uh, Half the debate is this open discussion format that's unstructured, and so you have an audio delay plus no structure, and it gets a little chaotic. Well, we are usually chaotic. <laughs> chaotic's part of our charm. That's our shtick, chaos. Just again, I want to emphasize that it wasn't chaotic on my end at all. And I think perhaps Nathaniel isn't accustomed to this format. It had seemed to us that he had never actually even been in a hangout before of any kind. I've never done a hangout, so... I don't know how this works. I think he's used to standing up at a lectern and talking for an hour, 30 minutes or whatever, and then fielding what usually at a church talks are a very friendly set of questions afterwards. He acts like the unstructured part of it was just kind of thrown on him and uh, he wasn't really ready for that. But that's an agreement that we all came to before the debate. And that's the direction they wanted to go in. My opponent, Dr. Mays, really had three main points. The first one, and you can see this in the opening five minutes of his presentation, is basically he says, I'm incompetent to make my arguments, that I have no training in these fields, I don't have an evolutionary biology degree. It's simply true. Nathaniel has a PhD from Harvard. His PhD and his prior work, none of it was relevant to the fields that he's writing a book on now. If I were to write a book on developmental biology, a field that I have very little knowledge of beyond sort of an undergraduate knowledge. I mean, I teach a little bit of it from a textbook in my genetics class, but I've never done any research in that field. I'm not known in that field at all. I haven't authored any papers in that field. I haven't had any courses in developmental biology. So if I wrote a book on developmental biology with my background, someone who is a developmental biologist, a professional developmental biologist, who's trained in this field, has a proven track record in research in this field, would be right in telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about. These are just facts. Now, it's entirely possible that someone with no training in phylogenetics or population genetics really buckled down and learned it. 
But like I said, I see no evidence that he's learned any of it because he's made such glaring omissions in the book that are relevant to the field. When any reader sees a popular book that's geared towards a popular audience, it makes outlandish claims that aren't in line with the consensus. And the author has no real expertise in the topic that the book is on. Those are red flags that that's not a book that a layperson should trust. You know, Dr. Dean doesn't have a legitimate scientific background. This may seem a bit pedantic, but how do you pronounce Nathaniel's last name? Gene, I don't know. I mean, it's spelled Jeanson, right? That's what I thought. But his colleague, Georgia, just pronounced it Jeanison. I just pronounced it Jeanson, and nobody corrected me on it. This is also a very pedantic kind of thing. And I corrected him on this. It's a little thing, but lots of little things like that tells me he's just never been around evolutionary biology at all. So like he keeps citing this undergraduate evolution textbook where he gets what he thinks is a coalescent equation from the author's name is Futuyama. And it's Futuma that you took from an undergraduate textbook, you took from Futuma. I actually cited Futuyama, Futuma, and I he adds an A and he mispronounces it. It drives me crazy. And I, I had to correct him on it. But it's just something that that textbook, Fatuma's textbook, has been in several editions. And it is sort of the classic starting point by which undergraduate and graduate students learn evolution. So it's so familiar. That's, this is what I'm saying. It seems like a nitpicky thing to correct him on that. But Douglas Fatuma's name is so familiar to people in evolutionary biology that anyone who has been around the field would never mispronounce his name like that. And then a, a second claim he makes there, and then you, you see it brought up again and again in, the, in the, the free open exchange, is that there's many errors of omission. So this is kind of consistent with his first one. He's saying, I don't have training in evolutionary biology. And so my book has lots of science, but science that's not relevant to the question, because I'm not going with the mainstream evolutionary practice. It has nothing to do with going with the mainstream evolutionary practice. It has to do with being knowledgeable in the topics that the book is covering. And those are population genetics, ecology, biogeography, systematics, molecular evolution. Those are the topics that the book is covering. If you omit those major parts of those fields that are relevant to the points you're trying to make, that's fair to bring up. If I write a book about World War II and I completely omit anything about Adolf Hitler, <laughs> then someone is going to be rightfully critical of my book as having a glaring error of omission in it. It has nothing to do with requiring him to adhere to any evolutionary view. I'm just asking that he portray the field accurately like someone who would be knowledgeable of that field. And the third claim, which is really the main point of his opening, is that uh, my claims have already been falsified. And this is where he's using, again, a number of these slides from earlier in the year and uh, papers that I was familiar with. So how do you know that someone is not following your book? When they say, when they say well, your book says this, we've tested it and it's false, and when, in fact, what they say about my book is the opposite of what my book says. The papers I was talking about go back to David Baum's lab, and those are testing predictions of special creationism. The key part of his model, and any creationist model, especially young Earth creationist model, is you have lineages of organisms that never shared a common ancestry and all appeared at exactly the same time. So that produces what looks more like a forest of separate trees that are not connected to one another through ancestry versus a single tree. Those papers test those two competing hypotheses. Now, he claims that they are ignoring functional variation that can recreate a nested hierarchical pattern among different families. Yet he cannot explain what that functional variation is or where it comes from and how it could recreate a nested hierarchy across different lines of evidence. So the fact that you would get the same nested hierarchy in Intron and also in a coding gene at the third position sites and in a transposable element analysis and a bunch of other things, that doesn't fit with his model that there's some function that is going to magically somehow recreate this nested hierarchy that you would expect based on morphological traits, say. And also, in the paper, I explicitly told him that in the Bontrager paper that I went over in some detail, is that they account for things that he is calling function. So they account for things like codon bias, even codon bias separately for each gene. Codon bias that is specific for, say, mouse, which is also very similar codon bias for humans. 
biases related to the content of guanine and cytosine bases in there. So they account for a lot of the variation that Jensen would say was functional. So he's not understanding that these papers are testing some key predictions of his model. And where he says they aren't testing predictions of his model, his predictions aren't well-formed to begin with. One example would be, uh, and he's got about six or seven papers he cites to say that have all been, have all tested these claims and disproven them, never mind that they were all published before 2017. That's exactly right. They were published before 2017. They were explicitly testing models of common ancestry versus single ancestry across different families, and he never bothered to deal with them in his book. Again, it's an error of omission. If he was making a strong argument that common ancestry among, say, taxonomic families was wrong, he would have to deal with those papers that actually came out before his book. He says, for example, a number of those papers tried to say, well, if, if life occurs in a, in a groups within groups pattern, the technical term is a nested hierarchy, this would falsify creation. Or if there's a certain number of differences, genetic differences between creatures, this would falsify creation. That's not quite what those papers are saying. They're not saying a sort of similarities between things. They're talking about patterns of similarities and differences that you would expect based on the conclusion that different families never shared a common ancestry versus the actual patterns that you observe in the data. And so if based on everything we know about genetics, you can make predictions about what you would expect biological diversity and genetic diversity to look like if different families never shared a common ancestry. Now, David Baum and other of these papers, that one was focused on primate families and just genetics at these silent sites and coding genes. There are other papers that incorporate multiple lines of evidence. Most of these lines of evidence, Nathaniel doesn't want to talk about, including biogeography and morphology and genetics. And they incorporate all those things together to test single ancestry of families, say, versus common ancestry. And Single ancestry, the creationist prediction, fails every single time. In the book, I explicitly say, and I derive over several pages, an argument for saying, no, from a design creation perspective, you would expect a groups within groups pattern. So Nathaniel says, from a design creationist perspective, you would expect to see these patterns. A design creationist perspective is a religious affirmation. You can't ask scientists to first adopt your particular and very narrow religious views as the basis for a hypothesis to test. So sure, I mean, he's right. If you adopt a creationist perspective, then you are going to make this prediction that there, or you might even see evidence for these nested hierarchies. And you might explain them in some context of an omnipotent designer. But that doesn't allow you to test them scientifically. What you say is scientific is just an extension of your religious belief about where biological diversity comes from. And besides, if his creationist model predicts nested hierarchies and evolution predicts nested hierarchies, then you can't test those two things against one another. So if he's saying that his model predicts exactly the same thing as the evolution model does, then it's not science because you can't measure those predictions against an alternative. You might notice there was kind of a funny look on my face at some parts of this debate because I kind of felt like I was being gaslit. <laughs> I'm talking about things that are actually in the book. And then he's saying, did you read my book? Did you read my book? And show me from my book and show me from the book. What do you think I said in my book? I want you to show me from my book. I'd like to see from my book. Show me from the book. What would I say in the book? Give me more from the book. And I'd like to see some evidence from your slides that you've read the book. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's in there. So I felt really kind of taken aback by the whole thing. I mean, if I said something that was a mischaracterization of the book, he should have just said, that's not really what I meant, and then explain it. But he just sort of kept sort of putting the seed in my mind like, that's not what I said. That's not what I said. God didn't create species. He didn't create even a genus. He created the horse kind. So donkeys, horses, zebras are all part of the same kind that came from a common ancestor on board the ark, this sort of idea. Again, when he's defining them as kinds, he's asking a scientist to adhere to this belief. What we can test scientifically is do different groups of organisms, did they originate at the same time? So they have the same length of their population history? And did they originate separately? Now, what that means as far as what you call them or did God create them is irrelevant. We're testing that narrow prediction and that's it. 
when he starts laying this religious level onto everything of God created these kinds, then what he's saying moves into the realm of being untestable because an omnipotent God can create nature to appear to us in any way that they want and for any reason. So no matter what the outcome of the data is, you could always chalk it up to some action of an omnipotent being. So therefore, any prediction he's making that is predicated on the action of some inaccessible, divine, omnipotent agent is not science. I, I wish I knew what to expect from a biblical perspective of, about how many genetic differences should exist between these two. I don't, so you don't find it in the book. Well, uh, one of the papers Dr. May cites claims that we do and then says it's wrong. So they basically invent a creationist prediction, then falsify it and say the book has been disproved. The creationist prediction is that there are different lineages of organisms that appear at exactly the same time and never share a common ancestry. Based on what we know about genetics, we can test how the actual data fit that scenario versus a scenario where they share a common ancestry. So it is a prediction of any creationist model. Uh, what I ended up doing during the, during the open free exchange was to use it basically a Socratic method. Ask him questions to try to reveal, no, he's not familiar with the argument. Socrates did not walk around Athens saying, did you read my book? That's not a Socratic question. And that is 90% of the questions he asked me were that. Where is it in my book or did you read my book? That's not something that Socrates would have done. Uh, and, and also, if you think about it, if one of his main points is errors of omission in my book, that's going to be a tough point to make if you can actually represent what's in the book. <laughs> it's a fair criticism. Again, if I write a book about World War II and I don't mention FDR or Winston Churchill or Adolf Hitler, I've written a pretty lousy book about World War II. I mean, what's in the book is his creationist model. He can only sort of make a convincing case for it if he leaves things out, if he leaves out other mutation rates. And I talk about this. I know the mitochondrial mutation rate that he uses. I cited it in the slides. It was right there, and I explained why you don't want to focus on that particular mutation rate and why it doesn't reflect what a long-term substitution rate is and the variation in mutation rates measured over different time scales. So I explicitly pointed out something in those chapters, by the way, that he uses, which is that particular mitochondrial mutation rate, and then I go on about why that's wrong because it leaves out this entire relevant discussion on mutation versus substitution rates in genetic population genetics. After the debate, someone reminded me of an article he had written that I think really explains a lot and makes a tremendous amount of sense of what happened. So Dr. Mays had written an, an article, a blog post in 2014, in praise of ridicule. And if you read the article, his point is basically, look, I think creation is, is so ridiculous, it's gone on for so long, it's so unscientific, why waste time trying to argue against it? Just make fun of it. That blog post where I talk about ridicule in the context of these ideas, that is actually a quote that comes from Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson said, ridicule is the only weapon which can be used against unintelligible propositions. And this is an Enlightenment era thinker who was dealing with some things that he viewed as nonsense. And if someone has an unintelligible position and it's divorced from reality, then sometimes that's all that position has earned. And I carefully say in that post that what I'm out to ridicule in these instances are the ideas, not the people who are presenting them. I understand the reasons why he's doing what he's doing. And the ridicule is reserved for the ideas, not the person. And that's and I, what we see a lot. Yeah. I mean, they don't actually deal with the arguments. They say they want dialogue, but then they say, well, I'm not going to read any of your papers. I'm not going to read any of your stuff. So you can't have a dialogue then about the science. It's just a, a bunch of ad hominem attacks is what it ends up being. Now, there's a great irony in Georgia expressing some disdain at this approach that Thomas Jefferson used and I recounted in my blog because Ken Ham uses almost nothing but ridicule against virtually everyone he disagrees with, including evolutionary biologists. I mean, how many one-liners does Ken Ham have? Like, you know, were you there? One-liners that are just meant to sort of poke fun and be a rhetorical device. So Ken Ham is using ridicule all the time. So I would advise Georgia and Nathaniel that if they are really so opposed to ridicule in ideas that they find unintelligible, that they should first lecture their boss about it. 
Now, finally, I'd like to say that if it's a flat earth debate and flat earthers are visiting Nathaniel or Georgia and they are pontificating about how the consensus about a spherical earth is a fraud and not supported by the evidence and that their flat earth model is clearly biblical, I think they too would look at that idea as one that deserves ridicule because it's so absurd. Is the earth flat? The flat earthers have a good explanation for that. I'm sure they do. They say that the... Sh <laughs> like, if it's not enough that the Earth is flat, the sun is really tiny and only a few thousand miles away. And you can't tear down one model yeah. without having another model to support Particularly what you say. Thinking the Earth is 6,000 years old is an idea on par with thinking the Earth is flat. He said, I've read the book twice over the summer, taking extensive notes. So is he lying? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think what happens is if you have the attitude, it's all... this. If you, if you have the attitude, this is all ridiculous. There's no point. And I'm just going to treat it with ridicule. You're going to read it, read it <laughs> in a cursory manner. I read the book. The idea that the earth is 6,000 years old has been demonstrated for the past two centuries to be an absurd idea that isn't even remotely in line with the available evidence. Now, I'll read Nathaniel's book, and I'm happy to see what he has to say. And I read the book. There is nothing in there from beginning to end. There is nothing in there that would convince me as a scientist that there is empirical evidence or even a remotely testable model for Nathaniel's views. So I take issue with this fact that I somehow read it, but I didn't read it. I read it and it's nonsense. Like I said, it's quasi science. If someone reads it without any background, it can look very convincing. But if you have the background and you see these sorts of papers and you see these sorts of analyses all the time, you see just the holes in it. And that's why it's just another creationist book meant for a popular audience. I think in his mind, he, he honestly believes he's read it because he comes in with the attitude of four-year-old attitude. It's all ridiculous. Let's just make fun of it. <sighs> Again, the attitude that he's calling a four-year-old's attitude was the attitude that Thomas Jefferson took. From a scientific perspective, these are ideas that are simply absurd. The Earth is not 6,000 years old. It's just not. Just like the Earth is not flat. If he thinks he has a scientific model, I'm happy to entertain that. But these aren't four-year-old opinions. And if you watch the debate, you'll see his attitude for, for large parts of it is really condescending and, and, again, consistent with ridicule. In my opinion, was not a debate of ridicule. I think he took some of Dr. Mays' points personally when I don't think they were. I think Dr. Mays was rather gracious. And I agree. I think Dr. Mays held himself to the most highest of professional ethics. I think that he actually went into the discussion with good intent and principal charity. He was not out to try to get Dr. Jensen or play this game of gotcha. He wanted to discuss the book and what was written in the book. Unfortunately, I don't think that's actually what happened. I don't think that there was anything disingenuous or insulting about Dr. Mays' behavior that night. I think they both presented themselves in a professional manner, and I was very pleased with both of them on a professionalism standpoint. What I discussed with the hosts, hosts uh, the day of, so the guy called me up Wednesday afternoon. I would be that guy. Kyle's that guy. And said, hey, we want to discuss the format for the debate the day of. We had an agreement going in, part of the contract, of the structure of the debate. So I wasn't calling to go through the structure the day of. I was calling to go through and make sure that we were all on the same page in terms of timing, that his presentation would be timed and be able to fit in appropriately to what we had allotted. That was all that this was. And in that phone call is actually when that time frame and the format that we had agreed to months earlier went out the window. That's when he decided that he wanted to take a different approach, maybe not be so rigid and open it up to that back and forth open discussion. So it wasn't me or the show that changed the format at the last minute or called to go through the format at the last minute. And we discussed, I said, you know, it'd really be nice in light of what they had done the night before to try to introduce the science. Why don't we just, why don't, why don't we split this debate up? He verifies what I was saying right there. See, John Perry's show, that episode, kind of tipped the scales and changed everything because he then, I think, realized how much actually was in his book that he was not going to be able to translate to anything sensible to the audience. To me, if, if you just have one person ridiculing, you talk about high-level science, people leave learning nothing, and they're going to think it's a waste of time. In the debate, Dr. Mays, he made some very specific critiques of the book. He talked a lot about the difference between mutation rate versus substitution rate. 
That is the huge flaw that Dr. Jensen ignored in the book. What is the difference? A mutation rate is how many mutations happen each generation. The substitution rate is how many of those actually end up becoming dominant in a population. He had an opportunity here, Dr. Jensen did, to actually address that, explain why he rejects substitution rates when no other scientist does. But he just didn't do that. Instead, he decided to say, oh, you're not even addressing my book because (laughs) Dr. Mays didn't specifically say which page and read the actual quotes. I was kind of surprised by that because my impression of Dr. Jensen was that he's kind of above some of the more shady tactics that creationists usually do, but then he was just didn't play by decent rules. Now, he has said he's anxious for round two. He's put that on mine, uh, and I'd be quite open to that. He says he'd be open to that. That, to me, sounds different than his enthusiasm the day of to set a round two. I, too, would love to feature a round two of this. I think Dr. Mays would be more than happy to. If we do another round of ridicule, I don't know that it's going to be productive, but I'd be happy for that. He's very hung up on this now that he's read that blog, and I can tell it's getting under his skin a little bit. In the discussion we had on non sequitur itself, everything I pointed out was relevant to the seemingly scientific arguments that he was trying to make, whether it's how misleading the mutation rate that he uses is, how people have tested common ancestry versus multiple ancestries over time. I pointed out differences in the coalescent. By the way, within a kind, as he calls it, he believes there's neutral variation, which means you can have a coalescent event in mitochondrial DNA, but in those same kinds, you would have a deeper mitochondrial event for every nuclear locus you looked at. And so those were points that I was making. I was discussing the science. As far as his academic track record, It's just a fact that on paper, from his published work and his scientific background, he doesn't have that expertise, and he never showed in the book that he gained any of it in the time since. So if he calls that ridicule, you know, I guess that's what he's going to call it. But it's just a fact. For 40 years, if not longer, evolutionists have said creation isn't science. We shouldn't treat it as science. We shouldn't allow it to be taught as science. Uh, And the main reason is it doesn't make testable predictions. This book refutes that. He doesn't actually make testable predictions in this book. All of his things that he calls predictions are ideas that are predicated on an adherence to a religious belief first and foremost. The basic idea that you have different lineages that appeared at exactly the same time and never shared a common ancestry has been falsified over and over and over again. And he keeps calling people who disagree with him evolutionists. No one within science calls themselves an evolutionist any more than someone who's a physicist calls himself a gravitationalist. I'm a geneticist. I have a tenure-track position in genetics. My research is in molecular systematics. I have a background in research in behavioral ecology and population genetics. Those are the fields that I study. Him calling people evolutionists, which is what creationists do to sort of make this an us and them kind of thing, that they're persecuted by this other group, is not helpful. He's getting critiques by scientists, professional scientists, and writing those critiques off as just these are critiques coming from evolutionists is not productive. So my perspective is it's okay for evolutionists to say we reject it because we don't take it seriously. What they cannot say in light of the events of the past year is we reject it because it's not science. I can absolutely say I reject it because it's not science. It's written for a popular audience. The first three chapters of it, at least, are basically a high school retelling of basic biology. It's not an academic book. None of the work that he's done has gone through the proper peer review process. Nothing that he's published has made an impact on the field. It's not getting cited in other papers. So what he's done in the past year or however long is not science because he hasn't participated in science. He's been in this bubble of AIG that condones what he's doing. And his goal is to present the science to lead people to a certain religious belief. Well, thanks, Nate, for that for that information. And a lot of times they'll say, oh, we're pseudoscience. You know, this is pseudoscience. It's false science. And he actually came up with a different term. Um, He called it quasi science. (laughs) My opening statements in the non-secular debate clearly say why I prefer the term quasi-science over pseudoscience. And the reason I do, I'm trying to be generous to them. 
because pseudo means false, it implies there's a deliberate lie under the surface. Like, for instance, they know evolution is true, but they're inventing narratives that they know are false. And I don't think that's the case, so I'm reluctant to call what they're doing pseudoscience. Quasi means as if, and it doesn't have the same connotations of a deliberate lie that the word pseudo does. You know, Georgia Purdom has these articles on the Answers in Genesis site where she talks about how natural selection is an evolution. And to explain this, she uses definitions of evolution from like children's textbooks. So it just shows you how far removed from science they really are when they're writing articles that have to cite children's books to get their definitions from. Mays did say he was not an atheist, um, so I'm not sure. He didn't say exactly what he was, but he made it clear what he wasn't. I'm not an atheist, and this has nothing to do with me being against anyone's religion. If your beliefs aren't causing you to hurt anyone else or yourself, if you're not forcing your beliefs on anyone else, and if you're not misrepresenting those beliefs as something that are not, then I'm totally fine with whatever you want to believe. If you just acknowledge that you have these religious beliefs and they bring you some meaning and comfort in your life, I'm all for that. I'm not against religion or theism or Christianity or any of those things. In fact, a lot of the teachings of Christianity that I grew up with still resonate with me today. Now, I don't necessarily believe in a personal God in the way that they do. Maybe I don't know what I believe about God, but I definitely am not an atheist. Whenever someone is always making this into an ideological thing of we are the Christians and this is Christian science and there's secular science and the secular scientists are atheists and we are the Christians, that's a sign for anyone listening to the discussion that they're not to be trusted. I don't care about making people atheists. I don't care about evangelizing to anybody. All I care about is science literacy. Now that it's all said and done. Do you regret doing the debate? You know, there's a lot of discussion among scientists about should we or should we not do these sorts of things? Should we or should we not engage with people like Nathaniel or Georgia or Ken Hovind or Ken Ham? You know, I understand the arguments that are made that say we shouldn't do that because in a way, if you're a professional scientist and you even sort of entertain these issues with them, it has the perception of legitimizing what they're doing in science. So I'm happy to do it, but I'm also emphasized that what they're doing is not science. And it's not a debate, really, because these are issues that have been solved a long time ago scientifically. And the alternatives they're putting forth are simply not things addressable as science. So I don't regret it, and I'll probably keep doing it. I think part of the story for me personally is I grew up a kid who was very interested in dinosaurs and nature, and I grew up in a creationist household. And I was told stories about Noah's Ark <laughs> and, you know, the flood and things like that. And I knew how many, I was already very interested in animals and I knew that and this can't, this can't be right, right. So I started reading about evolution on my own, probably when I was in junior high, maybe. And it was just, it was fantastic. It was just so interesting and it explains so much. And, and so this subject is near and dear to me both in terms of my community and the region that I live in, and also my personal background. So I think erring on the side of confronting them on these issues is probably outweighs the negative side of potentially the perception of legitimizing what you're doing, if that makes any sense. Wow. Well, thank you, Dr. Mace, for stopping by and sharing your side of the story. Herman is regularly posting more of his science and debate reactions at his blog at monophilia.org. And you can follow him on Twitter at Herm Mays. Also, thanks to my good friends Steve and Kyle from The Non Sequitur Show, John Perry from Stated Casually, and Shannon Q from Shannon Q for their perspectives. Links to all their channels are in the description as well as to the debate videos themselves in case you haven't seen them yet. Hey, what about me? I'm the one who called this guy a liar in the after show. Have you been been buried in nothing but lies your entire life or was there was a time before that nope not today we're done sorry arn if you haven't already please subscribe to apologia to make sure you catch the latest science videos and ham and egg news episodes 
huge thanks as always to my patrons, without whom my work on this channel wouldn't be possible. Thanks to everyone for watching. Until next time, later.